welcome everyone. My name is Rebecca Lowe. I am the Adult Program Coordinator at the Lewis Public Library, and thank you for joining us this evening. Welcome to our series, Science and Society, Making Sense of the World Around Us. This lecture series is co-organized and moderated by Fred Dilla, Executive Director Emeritus of the American Institute of Physics and author of Scientific Journeys. Uh, also by Linda Dilla, former Public Information Officer at the Jefferson Laboratory in the US Department of Energy, and Colin Norman, the former news editor at Science. So with that, I would like to turn this over to Colin. So Colin, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, I'm delighted to introduce uh, to, to tonight's speaker, um, Karen Baca. Uh, she is a professor at the University of British Columbia and uh, currently the Mar Marina S. Horner Distinguished Visiting Professor at the Harvard uh, Radcliffe Institute. She has a PhD in Global Environmental Change from Oxford University, where she was a Rhodes Scholar. And she's published um, many, many academic publications, which have been cited by other researchers more than 17,000 times. Uh, she's been an advisor to numerous national and international organizations, and uh, she's currently writing a book about how digital technologies can help address issues such as climate change, biodiversity loss, and water insecurity. Uh, she's going to be talking tonight about her new book, uh, The Sounds of Life, which I can highly recommend. Very, very readable. And as uh, Rebecca said, we encourage you to uh, get it from our co-sponsor, Browse About Books. So with that, let me turn it over to Karen and uh, welcome. Thank you so much for the introduction. I'm delighted to be here. I'm going to share my screen and I'm hoping that you can let me know if you can see it. Yes, yeah. we can. Yep, we can see it. Thank Ooh. you. All right. So. I will not be able to monitor the chat during the talk, but I do warmly welcome your questions. I'll speak for about 40, 45 minutes and uh, look forward to a discussion after that point. So I'll begin by noting that there's been a fast emerging scientific agenda regarding the sounds of nature. And I'll explain a little bit about that scientific agenda throughout this talk. There's a lot of detail both with respect to the ecology uh, and also the digital innovation. So I've broken the talk down into these sections. I'll start by describing nature's symphony, this broad, this vast array of sounds that occur in nature, many of which occur beyond human hearing range. After we explore those sounds, I'll discuss the new digital technology that is being used to record and decode these sounds, revealing fascinating insights about non-human communication, about the ability of many species to detect complex ecological information from sound, including species without any apparent means of hearing. We will then discuss very briefly some of the more controversial topics, notably non-human language and interspecies communication, and I'll close by discussing some of the new science on risks posed by noise pollution to um, animals, including us. So to begin, I'd like to bring a voice into the room. Uh, I'd like you to guess what is making this sound. So that is actually a bat and many of the sounds that uh, we are discussing today have been recorded in the high ultrasound that is frequencies above human hearing range. Um, that recording was slowed down to a frequency at which it is audible to humans. Um, I'll say a little bit more about bats later in the presentation, but that's just one example of vocalizations that scientists are now recording. We have, of course, known for about a century that bats 
are capable of echolocation or biosonar, but only recently have scientists begun systematically recording and decoding bat vocalizations, revealing some pretty astounding aspects of bat behavior. You might be familiar with dolphins, of course, who also echolocate, but you may not know that recent research has shown that dolphin communication is exceptionally complex um, to the point where dolphins, like bats actually, have individual uh, signature whistles that function as names. Many animals are able to hear and vocalize in the high ultrasound, um, but I I, I note that um, humans, if we once had this ability, we've mostly lost it, although some humans, particularly those born blind, can echo range, uh, a, a type of echolocation. But some of our primate cousins, like this tiny tarsier, can actually vocalize in the high ultrasound, um, and many other species can as well. So at the other end of our hearing, range below the frequencies at which we can hear lies the realm of the infrasound these long slow sound waves that are very long that are very powerful that can pass through soil and stone even solid walls they travel very long distances these are the, the sounds that elephants use to coordinate their movements across very long distances and scientists think that elephants can even hear very distant thunderstorms using infrasound so elephants are quite amazing creatures. Um, recent work by Lucy King, for example, has demonstrated that they can actually um, identify specific threats, alarm calls for honeybees, um, alarm calls for humans and different types of humans. Elephants can actually describe humans with a great deal of specificity, perhaps a greater degree of precision than we can describe them. But um, although scientists have long been familiar with elephant infrasound, it's only more recently that we realized a large range of species is actually capable of vocalizing in the infrasound and an even bigger range of species can hear infrasound. Here's a great example the peacock so the of course the famous mating dance of the peacock has been known for millennia um, it is a visual display the peahens respond to the peacock's tail but only recently have we realized that the peacocks are actually making loud infrasound with their tails if you look at the biomechanics of the tail that you can sort of see it intuitively it looks a little bit um, uh, like a satellite dish and uh, if you were able to hear in the infrasound, you would hear a, a sort of loud rock concert being made by the peacock. The, the infrasound is vibrating the comb on top of the peacock's head, and it's vibrating the comb on top of the peahen's head. And the peahens actually pay quite a bit of attention to the sound made by peacocks. What's astounding to me is that we have known about, lived with peacocks for millennia, and we only have recently realized in the past decade that they are making infrasound. We've simply really never listened in. So many other animals like tigers uh, make and sense infrasound, even our planet itself. So the very, very deepest infrasound of all is made by geological phenomenon. So on top of the biophony I was just explaining to you, there's a geophony, the sounds of our planet, and that could include uh, the, the sounds made by a distant thunderstorm, the howl of a hurricane, a volcano calving glaciers. Um, our planet has a, a quasi heartbeat, the, the sound of ocean waves regularly breaking on continental shelves creates a regular pulse of infrasound. Uh, when an earthquake occurs, it can ring um, the atmosphere like a quiet bell with very low infrasound. So animals can hear many of these sounds, even though humans cannot. So that means that in nature, silence is an illusion. What we think of as silence is actually filled with sound, and we're now able to access this sound through the aid of a technological prosthetic, a digital eavesdropping device or a set of eavesdropping devices. And that brings me to the second topic, which is digital listening. 
So this is an audio moth. It's um, a DIY device uh, that the cheapest will cost you less than $100. You could build it yourself. This is an example of Moore's Law, right? Uh, devices have come down in size and cost. Um, these are now being installed pretty much everywhere on the planet, from the depths of the ocean to the highest mountaintops, from the Arctic to the Amazon. It's large arrays, continent-wide, um, very small systems, as small as a pond, Amateurs are doing it as well as professionals, and we are generating a tsunami of digital data, digital recordings. Some of these recordings will be encoded in spectrograms. Here's an example. So you can imagine um, how complex an entire soundscape might be. Scientists sometimes record individual species that vocalize. Frequently, however, they also record entire landscapes and the combination or the the collection of sounds made by landscape is called a soundscape so you can map frequency over time for a soundscape and one of the things that you'll notice is in a very biodiverse soundscape the spectrogram will be full and bernie krauss was one of the first people to do some of this work beautiful work and um, his hypothesis the acoustic niche hypothesis is evident here um, different species essentially have evolved over time to distribute the ranges in which they vocalize across different frequencies so they're not competing for the same acoustic space or niche and much like we have different radio stations on the radio dial uh, so the insects you can see here the birds the um, the pre-dawn versus the night chorus the rain all of these are intelligible to an eco acoustician who could decode this image much like a radiologist might decode an x-ray or an mri So one of the most beautiful things about spectrograms is they tell us, they give us a snapshot of biodiversity. And if we were to lose biodiversity, what would happen is that this spectrogram would go dark, it would go blank. And low cost ecological monitoring is actually possible using ecoacoustics and spectrograms. We can actually get a very fine grained sense of biodiversity simply by installing um, acoustic recorders, applying what are called ecoacoustic indices that map the change um, in density of these spectrograms over time. So this allows us to generate some new conservation and monitoring tools. Um, here's just one example. This is a study that was done um, in Latin America and Peru. On the left hand side, um, we see a spectrogram generated from a plot that had been logged according to Forest Stewardship Council principles, so that's ecologically friendly logging. On the right hand side, you see the non FSC logging and you see the reference in the middle, the, the control. What's really interesting about this is, first of all, there's a, a, a real difference um, acoustically between the three plots, but also the logged plot actually has more biodiversity. You might be wondering why. The explanation is that when you selectively remove trees, what is occurring is a, a more patchy uh, um, uh, sort of ecological distribution and you have areas in the forest obviously where the canopy no longer exists you've got new growth coming in um, much more if you like vertical <laughs> diversity uh, and so you have um, actually higher biodiversity in the plot that has been logged with fsc logging so that's an example just a sampler of the work being done by bioacousticians and ecoacousticians now where does that lead us in terms of um, new insights into um, the non-human world? The, the book sort of has uh, a lot of discussion of different aspects related to different species. Um, today, I'll just provide a couple of examples to, to whet your appetite about some of these debates. And the first debate I'll touch upon is non-human language. So I mentioned bats earlier as, as fascinating species. Jerry Carter is someone who studies bats. Um, it's very typical uh, this research will often involve digital acoustic recorders combined with some kind of biologging. And he has actually invented a new, very cool bat biologger um, that is very light, very portable and instantly updates whenever one bat with a chip passes next to another bat with a chip. So they function a bit like air tags. Um, and this is a real breakthrough because previously the loggers were quite expensive and you had to recapture a bat in order to download the data from the logger. That was actually quite difficult to do. A lot of loggers were lost. 
So this, this in, innovation is a real breakthrough. So Jerry Carter combines those very cool biologgers with digital acoustic recordings. And he is not the only one, Yossi Yavel in Tel Aviv, Miriam Knornschild in Germany. There's a large group of bat researchers now doing this work. And they have really been able to derive some profound insights about bats. Now, bats are a great example of how this research is overturning some common assumptions held in the, amongst the public about certain species. We often associate bats with, you know, um, creatures of the night, blood-sucking vampires, vectors of zoonotic disease. True, perhaps, <laughs> but um, they are also a quarter of a mammalian species. Um, and it turns out that the species that we've studied intensively using these techniques display some amazing, amazing capabilities. So one example is Miriam Knornstiles work with the greater sack, sack winged bat in Costa Rica. It's a great bat to study because it's um, diurnally active, active during the day, highly territorial and not migratory. So the birds are sort of in one place year after year and she can see them during the day and follow them around. Well, from studying this species, we've learned some very interesting things. One of them is um, bats communicate and in communicating have different signals that mean different things. Uh, they uh, trade favors, they hold grudges. Um, Jerry Carter has shown that they socially distance and um, go quiet and socially distance when ill. Um, bats trade food for sex. They um, have individual vocal labels that function like names that encode gender and kin identity. Uh, baby bats learn to speak. Vocal learning has now been demonstrated in, in this species. Um, so that means that baby bats learn to speak much like human babies do. The parents speak to them uh, um, in a kind of babbleese or baby language. In, in humans, we often speak at a higher pitch to babies. Bat mothers actually speak at a lower pitch to their babies, interestingly. So the baby bats start to babble and eventually they learn adult bat and they learn the dialect that is specific to their territory and their family. The greater sack wing bat, actually each uh, family grouping has a different territory and a different dialect and specific songs that they sing. The males sing these um, both to attract mates and to defend territory against one another. So these, these very complex convivial social lives um, that we, we, we really didn't suspect and all of this has opened up to us thanks to digital acoustics. Miriam Knornschild talks about the fantastic advances that have been made technologically that have enabled this research. Um, the digital recording devices, even 10 years ago, were, were portable, but what that meant was these big clunky sort of suitcase sized machines you could um, put somewhere in the forest, but as soon as the bats moved, you know, you were sort of stuck. But now the devices are so small, they can literally fit in your back pocket. And moreover, the advent of artificial intelligence means you can also create real time playback experiments, and that is the next frontier of this sort of research and there's a lot we can learn from these these playback experiments. This is Mirjam Knornschild, and this is one of her babbling baby bats. So here's another researcher, Camila Ferrara in Brazil. So she works at the Wildlife Conservation Society, does amazing work with turtles. This is a great example of how this research is surprising the scientific community with the finding that species that were believed to be largely mute are actually vocally active. So uh, Camilla's work was inspired by um, a PhD researcher named Julia Giles in Australia who did her research on a particular species of Australian freshwater turtle, identified a couple of hundred different sounds, um, and then traveled to Brazil and inspired Camilla to do her PhD with a lot of skepticism, I might add, from her supervisors. Um, nonetheless, her research proved to be fascinating. So first of all, the finding that turtles do make quite a bit of noise, um, but the sounds they make are very, very subtle. They're very quiet and they're low frequency, and they're very, very intermittent. So the turn-taking ritual between humans, or birds for that matter, is quite rapid. We, without thinking, find it normal that the interval between when I stop speaking and my conversational partner starts speaking, that interval is less than a second in humans. In turtles, that, inf uh, that interval is much, much longer. So in order to get these data sets of turtle vocalizations, you have to be very patient. You have to be very, very quiet. Even the noise of 
you know, fins moving underwater or a snorkel bubbling could mean you won't hear these sounds. So this research is painstaking and took years, but Camilla Ferrara, like Julia Giles, identified a range of vocalizations made by, in this case, Amazonian freshwater river turtles, Podocnemis expansa. Uh, those amazing turtles that you might have seen the photos of. They do these mass haul outs on beaches. Now, the reason she got interested in this um, was actually that there was a perennial question, a sort of scientific mystery about how these turtles were able to coordinate their behavior, sometimes over very long distances, to all congregate on these hatching beaches at the same time. And in fact, it turns out that they're vocalizing to one another. Those are one of the ways that they do communicate. Her research went further, and she uh, actually accidentally stumbled on an even more intriguing finding. Um, in order to determine when after birth baby turtles start vocalizing, she inserted microphones in the turtle nests. You can see her listening here. Well, it turns out, much to her astonishment, that the embryos, the, the baby turtles, before they hatched from their eggs, were actually vocalizing, and there were particular vocalizations that they made to coordinate the moment of their birth. Now, not all turtle species do this, but this turtle species does, Podocnemis expansa. And of course, common sense, it seems like there would be an advantage to all hatching at once in terms of reduction of risk from predators. So not only did she come up with this astounding finding um, of baby turtles vocalizing to one another in the nest before birth, she also had microphones in the water nearby. Now, most scientists prior to her work had assumed that turtles lay their eggs and leave. They abandon their eggs. In fact, she documented the mother turtles in the water offshore vocalizing and guiding the baby turtles to the water. And then through the use of drones and biologging also documented the fact that the baby turtles and the mother turtles would swim together for up to a few weeks and the mother turtles would guide the babies to areas of safety in the flooded forest away from predators. This is the first documented evidence of parental care in Chelonians, thanks to digital bioacoustics. And this work also overturns a lot of assumptions we had um, about turtle species. Um, a researcher from, I think, ETH Zurich has just gone on and recorded 50 different turtle species around the world, all of which make noise. That research came out after I wrote the book. But you can see how fast this um, research frontier is unfolding. So one of the very important things that researchers are now realizing is if many species coordinate uh, their activities or convey complex ecological information through sound, if many species do this, then noise pollution becomes something that's very serious for environmental conservation. Um, some of you might have seen the headline in Science a few years ago, um, which read something like, the noise of boat motors is scrambling the eggs of baby fish. I'm, I'm not making that up. That's more or less verbatim the, the title of the scientific article. Um, so we are now realizing that many species are far more sensitive to noise pollution than we realize. So one of the um, conservation um, agendas that Camilla Ferrara and Julia Giles have now launched focuses on reducing boat motor noise around the time of turtle egg hatching because that may interfere with the ability of the baby turtles to coordinate their hatching, to find their mothers, um, and to swim to safety. So as this research frontier has progressed, we're learning even more astounding things about species that we did not realize had the ability to hear. Even very, very simple organisms. This is Steve Simpson. He's a professor at the University of Exeter, does very cool work on fish larvae and coral larvae. So coral, um, of course, uh, are animals. Well, some call them planimals. They're very unusual animals. And coral, if you've ever had the privilege of being on a reef, during a mass spawning event, which typically happens a few days after the new moon, uh, sorry, the full moon, um, what, what you'll see, of course, is this massive underwater fireworks as these coral larvae are produced, fertilized, and wash out to sea. They wash out to sea so that um, there's less risk of predation. They grow in the open ocean, and then um, they settle back on the coral reef. Scientists used to believe that coral larvae, which are microscopic, you know, they have no central nervous system. They're covered in little cilia, hairs, like the hairs on the inside of your ear. But they're very simple, uh, micro, uh, you know, microscopic organisms. Um, 
scientists used to presume that coral larvae hapless and helpless were just pushed around by winds, waves, and currents, and randomly settled on a coral reef. But Steve Simpson's work showed otherwise. So he did a set of ingenious experiments. Um, actually, he first did them with fish larvae and then with coral larvae. So imagine uh, an aquarium with a tank shaped like a maze with a central chamber and lots of arms. At the end of each arm is a speaker and each speaker is playing a different sound. This is a classic maze protocol experiment. Now in the central chamber, you can put fish larvae and then you can watch where the fish larvae swim. And it turns out that fish larvae, if exposed to different noise choices, you know, no noise, white noise, classical music, um, the sound of a degraded coral reef, the sound of a healthy reef, the fish larvae will consistently swim towards the sound of the healthy coral reef. Coral larvae do the same thing. Steve Simpson had built these choice chambers for experiments on fish larvae, and then um, some scientists, some Dutch scientists from Curaçao suggested doing an experiment with coral larvae. Steve Simpson's first reaction was, you have got to be kidding, coral larvae, there's no way, right? But since the apparatus was there, they tested it, the coral larvae, and lo and behold, the coral larvae tested under all sorts of conditions, different cycles of the moon, different types of noises, the coral larvae could distinguish between the sounds of a healthy and unhealthy reef, they would swim towards the healthy reef, and even more surprising, when offered the choice between any healthy reef, a reef chosen at random, versus their home reef, the coral larva would swim towards the home reef. Somehow, we don't know how, these very simple organisms are imprinting on the sound of the coral reef when they are born. That brief moment before they're washed out to see this mass spawning event, um, researchers speculate that, you know, this coral lullaby um, is imprinted um, on the larva who then use their cilia to detect sound in water, particle motion. They use their cilia to detect the sound and then swim back towards the coral reef. Now they're doing this over um, maybe a mile of open ocean or more. This puts them, they're, because they're very small, on the same scale of epic migrations as, you know, salmon, anadromous fish coming back from the ocean to their home spawning grounds, absolutely remarkable. So this is another example of which there are many, I talk about in the book, of organisms that we previously did not suspect had any capacity to detect sound, not only detecting sound, but also discerning ecologically relevant information from that sound and then acting upon that information. So where does that bring us to next? Um, well, in the question period, I look forward to discussing some of the implications for environmental conservation. But now, in the interest of time, I want to move on to one other controversial debate that has been sparked by this research agenda, and that is the topic of interspecies communication. So it turns out that interspecies communication is widespread, um, more widespread in nature than scientists had previously realized. A great example is um, the interplay, the acoustic interplay between bats and moths. So Bats use biosonar or echolocation, um, this, this kind of focused acoustic beam that's a bit like an acoustic flashlight. Um, they use that to hunt on the wing. Um, so what is, um, what is known is that those um, biosonar capacities are highly developed. Even fast moving insects can be detected by bats. But only recently did we learn that insects like tiger moths can jam bat sonar. So there's been this sort of lovely co-evolution between predator and prey, where certain um, species that are predated upon develop capacities that jam the echolocation capacity of bats. Um, bees and flowers, this is another great example. Yossi Yalval in Tel Aviv has done some interesting work demonstrating that when the, the sound of a buzzing bee, no bee is present, the sound of a buzzing bee is played near a flower. The flower will respond within minutes by producing more nectar and sweeter nectar. So there's some suggestion that flowers um, that are pollinated by bees are actually acoustically tuned to specific frequencies. Conversely, 
certain plants emit high ultrasound. We know from Monica Gagliano's work that corn plants emit very high um, ultrasound in a very narrow range. Um, so do other plants like tomatoes and tobacco. Yossi Yavel has done work on this. And intuitively, um, we tend to be able to hear at the frequencies at which we vocalize. And so both Gagliano and Yavel have done experiments um, demonstrating the um, ability of plants to respond to sounds in those frequencies. Insects, of course, can also hear in the high ultrasound. One experiment Yossi Yavel did uh, actually recorded the sounds of tomato and tobacco plants, healthy, dehydrated, or stressed. They cut some of the plants. That was the stressed group. They didn't water some of the plants. That was the dehydrated group. And then they had the healthier control group. So it turns out that the sounds made by the plants in these different states are distinct. And Yavel and his team trained an AI algorithm to detect the different sounds. And the algorithm was able to tell simply by listening whether the plant was thirsty and needed a drink or not, was healthy or not, was stressed or not. Presumably insects might be able to hear these sounds as well. That's a hypothesis that researchers are now testing. So all of this interspecies communication is going on all around us and we're just beginning to investigate. We've known for years that bats pollinate certain species. We've only recently learned that certain shapes of those plants are acoustically attractive to bats. The leaves uh, shape might be acoustically invariant, like a cat's eye mirror. It, there are lots of shapes that these plants have evolved to attract bat pollinators in the very dense foliage of the jungle or in various environments. So interspecies communication is going on all around us. But now scientists and entrepreneurs want to get in on the conversation. And the idea here is that it could be possible to invent a digital interspecies equivalent of the Rosetta Stone, of course, the famous artifact that enabled archaeologists to decode Egyptian hieroglyphics because the same uh, segment or fragment of a text was written in three different languages on the Rosetta Stone, two of which were known to archaeologists and the hieroglyphics were not. This decoding device enabled us to learn a great deal about ancient Egyptian culture. We cracked the code of Egyptian hieroglyphics. So scientists believe it might be possible to develop a, a sort of Rosetta Stone for non-human languages. One of the avenues they're pursuing is the use of um, the same types of deep learning algorithms that power Google Translate that are on your smartphone. So the idea here is that one converts um, uh, semantic relations to geometric relationships, you uh, can then mathematically encode them. So this is linear algebra and 3D. This is a depiction, what I'm showing you in a latent space of Portuguese and the, the placement of the different dots, each of which is a word, corresponds to how frequently they're used and how frequently they're used in association with one another. So this seems astounding, of course, and I, I want to um, emphasize that no one has yet cracked the code of these other languages in this way. But scientists believe we might one day have a sort of Google Translate for other non-species communicative regimes. And the species that are attracting the most research attention are elephants, East African elephant, um, sperm whales, um, dolphins, but also honeybees. And to give you a sense of how experimental this research is, how uncanny, I'm just going to talk to you a little bit about honeybee research. Now, honeybee research, um, of course, is longstanding. Carl von Frisch wins the Nobel Prize for his amazing work on the honeybee waggle dance, which encodes the direction and the distance to a nectar source using a very complicated figure eight dance. Since Carl von Frisch's work, of course, we've gone on to, to decode further signals in honeybee. The queen has her own signals. There's certain signals that mean specific things like stop. Um, so, so bees have a, a complex array of signals and the, the way they convey that information, of course, is vibrational and positional as well as acoustic. So because bees see polarized light, the way they orient their bodies to the position of the sun is part of the transition of that information. There may be an electrostatic component, there is a vibrational component because they touch their antenna to one another's abdomens, which have six degrees of freedom when they're conveying this language. So very complicated. So the thought that we could actually translate between human and honeybee is very ambitious. Just listen to this little snippet to see what I mean. 
Oh, we might not be able to hear the honeybee. Let's try once more. There we go. So you can imagine that it's incredibly complex to take something like that um, and translate it in a way that one could identify signals and potentially engage in playback experiments to test those signals. This is the work of Tim Landgraf in Berlin. Um, he's, his, he's a computer scientist who studies honeybees, which have a lot of interest for computer scientists because of their swarm behavior and all lots of other applications. Um, but he uses computer vision and acoustics to try to encode um, specific honeybee communication patterns in robots. And I'll just show you a video of one of his robots. So Landgraf's experiments are interesting. Um, in one of them, he was actually able to use a robot like this to communicate um, specific waggle dance information to the honeybees. And on one occasion, the honeybees actually were able to decode the information and fly to the nectar source. Now, he has not been able to replicate it. He's not even sure why it works. So it's, this is very preliminary and rudimentary, but this is the sort of research that's now underway, which of course raises lots of interesting ethical questions because the sorts of protocols that we apply to research on human languages or human communication are, are, are not applied in the same way to other species. If we do ever crack the code, as it were, of non-human inter, uh, interspecies communication, it's likely to be with sperm whales. There are two interesting research initiatives ongoing at the moment. One of them is Project SETI, Cetacean Translation Initiative, which spun out of Harvard. Um, the other is called the Earth Species Project, um, spun out of um, San Francisco. And then, of course, the Interspecies Internet. All of these groups are trying to take large data sets of non-human vocalizations and detect patterns and develop more sophisticated playback experiments. Oh, the elephant um, ethogram, the elephant dictionary is another great example. Um, sperm whales, of course, uh, are very large brained. They have very complex um, matriarchal societies that are highly social. Um, we, they, we know they have dialects. Um, so if, if we're likely to find complex um, language in any other species, it's probably in a species like this, although the definition of language is, of course, highly controversial. Some scientists assert that the term language should be reserved only for humans, and only humans are capable of the symbolic, the high degree of symbolic communication and the complex syntax that merits the use of the term language. Uh, others refute that and argue that we need to have a more inclusive definition of language. The debate, suffice to say, continues. One of the things I'll leave you with, though, is a sense of how little we know um, and how, how, how quickly this field is progressing. So humpback whale song, of course, has been known since the 1960s. There was a ton of, of amazing research um, on humpback whale song, its dialects, its transmission. And yet whales are such different creatures than us. They see the world through sound. Uh, in, you know, in some states, they only have one heartbeat a minute. Uh, they, the, the vocalization mechanism is utterly different. Their brains are hardwired for sound very differently and much more actually intensively than ours are neurologically. So the ability, the, the thought that we could even understand whale communication, if we could indeed translate it, is a sort of a deep philosophical problem. Um, there, Wittgenstein is famous for saying, if a lion could speak, we could not understand them. Nagel's, of course, famous paper on um, bats raised a whole you know generation or multiple generations of philosophical debate about whether we could indeed ever understand the life world of other creatures it may be that whales do have um language it may be they have even oral history but um will we ever be able to truly understand that not living in in the whale's environment not living in whales bodies this is a, a really open question that scientists are still debating so i'll leave you with a little bit of whale sound and then conclude with one more thought.
So as we are on the brink of all of these fantastic discoveries, there is a big threat on the horizon, and that is human noise pollution. We know scientific research has demonstrated the risks of noise pollution for humans in terms of increased stress, increased risk of heart attack and stroke, cognitive impairment, developmental delays. There's some new research coming out of Europe that demonstrates there's a higher risk of Alzheimer's if you live close to a highway with loud noise. The levels of ambient noise we accept in most cities have negative health impacts. It's a great unrecognized human health threat of our time. Um, there are new regulatory approaches that are being evolved. Here is an example of a noise radar in Paris. If you drive a very noisy scooter, you know, a two stroke engine through Paris and they detect that you're over the limit, safe limit, uh, acoustic threshold, um, they'll take a photo of your license plate and send you a fine. So we're going to, you know, see more cities clamping down on noise pollution. But non humans are even more acutely at risk than we are. This is an image of Posidonia oceanica, not the eel, but the grass. Seagrass is like the savanna of the sea, carbon fixing, biodiversity, extremely important ecologically. And there's been a, a very big loss of seagrass in the past few decades. No one really knows why, chemical pollution, boat anchors. It, um, some new research just out in the last 18 months demonstrates that Posidonia oceanica which is some of the oldest living organisms on the planet. They, they have organ, they have, these are clonal. So some of the, the seagrass in the Mediterranean has been dated to be between 100 and 200,000 years old. So it turns out that these um, plants are very, very sensitive to noise. A loud noise can disrupt the organelles that they use for orienting to gravity and also disrupt the fungi that have these rhizomatic associations that help the seagrass digest food. So when exposed to a loud noise, like a boat motor or a seismic air gun blast, the effect on the seagrass is to explode these organelles, to destroy them. The, by way of analogy, if you were exposed to a loud noise, you would lose your hearing, but you would also lose your ability to digest food and you'd lose your sense of orientation which way was up and down, you wouldn't be, even be able to walk. That's how debilitating loud noise is for seagrass. This means that um, bioacousticians and ecoacousticians are now caught in the fray of a much larger debate about overhauling environmental conservation regulations to account for noise pollution, particularly important given the rapid increase in industrial development of the oceans um, in the past couple of years under these so-called blue ocean initiatives. So noise pollution, uh, I would argue, is one of the biggest environmental and human health threats of our time. And it will be one of the greatest areas of debate and uh, innovation in environmental conservation in the next few years. So to conclude with a final thought, I've given you a very brief window into this, this, this very fast, uh, growing area of scientific research. I like to say that sonics is the new optics. Several hundred years ago, the invention of the microscope and telescope opened up entirely new worlds, seeing further into space and further back in time. Uh, uh, the, uh, the inventors of the microscope, Van Leeuwenhoek, had no idea that their discoveries would eventually lead to the discovery of DNA, the code of life, we are like those early inventors of the microscope and telescope. We have this new technology. We're, we're, we're literally just sort of wandering around describing all of the amazing things we're hearing, but we actually don't really know yet the full implications of these discoveries. Um, we, we haven't even begun to scratch the surface of the implications for ecology, for conservation. But one can say with some certainty that just like microscopes and telescopes decentered the human from the solar system, sonics decenters the human within the tree of life. We no longer have a strong acclaim to exceptionalism, for example, around um, complex communication. So with that, I will conclude and I will welcome your questions. Uh, thank you, Karen. That was just really fascinating. And uh, I should say the book is uh, is very fascinating, too. I just have one quick question to follow up on the noise pollution um, issue that you mentioned at the end. Uh, um, 
As far as marine noise pollution is concerned, we have just gone through a potential natural experiment where uh, marine traffic uh, dropped by, I think it was something like 80%. Uh, yeah. Marine noise accordingly. Do you know if there are any studies that yes, yeah, show yeah. the effects of that? Great question. So, um, I, ironically, a few years prior to the pandemic, some marine scientists had proposed a quiet ocean experiment. And indeed, the pandemic turned out to be such a quiet ocean experiment. One study by Rosalind Rollis um, off the east coast of North America was fascinating. Um, so, they track whales, they analyze stress hormones by analyzing whale feces. And they are also tracking their vocalizations and movement patterns. So they were able to document a rapid reduction in whale stress in um, uh, the, first uh, following 9-11 and then during the pandemic. So around the world, um, levels of industrial or human generated noise in the oceans dropped dramatically in those two instances. And um, then uh, we were able to document um, a variety of um, responses, mostly from the species that we already track intensively, like whales. Mm -hmm. I, I see some questions in the chat, and I don't know if you want to discuss any of those. Uh, if you see some that you would like yeah. to answer, just go ahead. Maybe I'll go in reverse order. Um, does coral larva listening to home coral sounds mean they have nerve cells to process them? So no, coral larva don't have a central nervous system. Um, so we actually don't know uh, how this is occurring. So if you were to ask Steve Simpson, how are coral larva doing this? He doesn't know. What he knows is that they are doing it. And so um, there's a great scientific mystery to be solved. So watch this space. If I were to give this presentation in five years, maybe I could answer that question. I will say though, that one hypothesis is that anything with cilia through a process of mechanoreception can detect particle motion. And there are different ways it can respond. Um, plants are a great example. Um, so there is a researcher named Heidi Apple at the University of Toledo. And she did a very interesting experiment on Arabidopsis thaliana a model organism in biology, mouse ear crest, very simple plant. So what she did with that experiment is she played sounds to the plants, white noise, music, insects chewing on the plants. So only in response to the sounds of the insects, and remember there is no insect present, no plant is being harmed, it's just the sound. The plants respond to the sound of the insect chewing on the plant by producing defensive um, biochemicals. She then did a follow-up experiment playing two different insects, one of which was a predator of that plant, the other of which was not a predator of that plant. The plants could discern the difference. They only produced the defensive biochemicals in response to the predator insect. So that means the sense of hearing of these plants is hearing is pretty exquisitely attuned to those insects. There's some kind of acoustic tuning between the plant and its predator. Now, Monica Gagliano has a very nice phrase when she talks about this. She says, well, of course, think about it, it makes sense long in deep time, long before organisms evolved ears <laughs> or eyes for that matter, they could sense the particle motion, the vibration in the water, and it, there would be some evolutionary advantage to, to being able to detect mates, predator, prey. And moreover, biochemical information is energetically costly and rather slow, but sound is faster and cheaper. So it would make sense for the ability to discern complex ecological information um, from acoustic, um, you know, uh, vibrations, I should say, biotermology as well as sound, which should probably be widespread in nature and perhaps universal. Now, Arab Arabidopsis thaliana has little cilia on their leaves, trichomes. And so the hypothesis there is that they are detecting the sounds through the same way the coral larva do, the cilia vibrate in response to the particle motion. And when they vibrate at the right frequencies, the response is generated. Now, the exact mechanics of that, we don't know, but um, we can we, we have now another wonderful scientific mystery to investigate. So I think, uh, Fred, you had a question too. Um, I could answer, if, I'll ask it for you, but go ahead. Uh, Karen, your book was remarkable. And one of the things that struck me was the number of very dedicated 
biologists, field biologists who spent years, sometimes when they were told by their supervisor that turtles don't make noise, don't bother. And what you have done in your book is describe many of these stories, these very dedicated field biologists that have put these questions together. And I remember one uh, one of your opening statements about Jacques Cousteau, who we always watched as kids. Yeah. There was an episode where he always described the silent kingdom. The silence of the deep. Yeah, there was no noise there, okay? So m the thing I want you to comment on was it was clear that the U.S. Navy produced a tremendous amount of data on underwater sound for mm -hmm. military purposes. And fortunately, that was declassified. Can you comment on how valuable that chunk of information was to science? Indeed. So in the opening chapters of the book, I spend some time telling the story of whales, whale sound. Um, the advent of submarine warfare and the discovery of the SOFAR channel, that is the, a, a deep channel in the ocean that due to very specific pressure, temperature, and salinity conditions allows for very long range transmission of sound. The discovery of the SOFAR channel was um, very important in the post-World War II period because it served as a, a sort of a secret weapon um, uh, as the US Navy and allies set up listening posts all over the world, listening for, uh, at the time, Soviet um, naval movements. So as they began setting up those listening posts, they heard all of these strange noises that they just referred to as biologicals, very, very odd, and they didn't actually know what they were. Um, but some of the early scientists who were involved in that work then went into civilian life, notably at Woods Hole, and began figuring out what these sounds were. And of course, it turns out they were whales. So whales dive down into the SOFAR channel. They use it like a telephone line. They are able to broadcast sound, their songs, their sounds across hundreds of miles of ocean. The hairs that stand up on the back of my neck every time I tell this story, Chris Clark, who's at Cornell, I mean, this was widely disbelieved, of course, but when it was proven, it was pretty shocking. There's a whale singing off the coast of Bermuda, and you can hear it in Ireland. So the whales had, had, had long discovered what the Navy had only recently figured out, and the whale sound was interfering with the Navy's business. So um, as were fish sounds, etc. So they put together these large secret databases of sounds, began analyzing them, and only recently relatively declassified them. But that certainly gave the spur to a lot of this um, initial research, although the, the, I think the credit needs to be given to some civilian researchers like Katie and Roger Payne, who were the ones who took these recordings, um, some of them which they'd gotten from naval researchers and then began analyzing their complex structure leading to you know peer-reviewed articles and that you might remember that best-selling platinum album well music well song um, that's still the best-selling nature album of all time so that set off this contemporary research agenda but i think the book then goes on to suggest that the new frontier is in these high ultrasonic and low infrasonic realms that we cannot hear without the aid of digital technology, and that we've got to expand our field beyond whales to these vast array of other creatures that we had no idea could make sound or respond to sound. So yeah, a little, there's a lot more to say about the um, US Navy, but you Made yes. that point very well, and I'd urge all in our audience to, to buy Karen's book and read it. It's really delightful. This was only a snippet of it. You'll mm -hmm. own it. Thank you. Uh, I, I do want to make one point about Sam's comment about um, does communication require some neural brain like processing. It depends how you define communication. This is a huge debate in science. Some will use the term plant neurobiology. Others will use the term plant signaling and communication. If you approach the topic from information theory and you simply assert that communication occurs when information is transmitted from sender to receiver that you can distinguish the signal from the noise and that results in, in, in um, meaningful ecological information being conveyed and the receiver responds in a predictable way, which you can test with playback experiments. Yes, we can communicate. Now that's not communication defined in, 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 from the contemporary, you know, you know, maybe a narrow linguistics perspective, but many scientists would argue this is indeed a, a type of communication, much hinges on our definition of communication, but it doesn't require neurons.
Well, unfortunately, we have to wrap this up at uh, at at uh, six o'clock. We can't can't go over today. So um, I won't ask the last question because I was going to ask you whether some of these um, uh, findings challenge the idea that humans are the only uh, beings with consciousness. That that could take us all night. It could take us all night. It's a different topic, and most researchers who study bioacoustics and ecoacoustics avoid it altogether. Um, so I would say uh, there, regardless of what one believes about consciousness, um, that the the communication shouldn't be confounded or conflated with consciousness. That the that a rich degree of communication does exist. And it may be that that one day leads us to some new insights about consciousness, but the fields are separate and the communication research stands on its own and is, I would argue, as important as the question of consciousness. Well, thank you, Karen. This has been just a great talk and, uh, and just fascinating. And I second um, Fred's uh, urging that people uh, buy the book, preferably from Browse About, if you can. So with that, let me turn it over to, uh, back to Rebecca. Yes, thank you. Thank you for joining us. Uh, so as is our custom, if you would like to unmute yourself and applaud and say thank you very quickly, you may do that. Our guest does need to be um, leaving uh, right now. So say thank you real quick. <laughs>